sphingolipids in the lipid bilayer. Okay? So here's a glycolipid. This lipid, th this gly this, um, sh these sugar residues have been attached to a glycerophospholipid or a sphingolipid in the, in the uh, uh, membrane. Now, one of the interesting things that we see when we look at membranes and we look at the distribution of these sugar residues is, number one, we always, and I don't know of any exceptions to this, we always see the sugars on the outside of the cell. So the sugars are arranged, they're attached to proteins or they're attached to the membrane molecules themselves on the outside of the cell. They're never on the inside of the cell. And the reason that that appears to be the case is that these sugar residues on the surface tend to be uh, what I like to describe as ID tags. So different cells have different ID tags on them, identifying what they are. And you have a set of ID tags that is unique to you. I shouldn't say unique. Some other people may have similar ones to what you do, but not necessarily identical to what you have. And these ID tags become very important when you do a transplant. So if I take uh, my, uh, one of my kidneys and I donate it to one of you, one of the things that the uh, people doing the transplant would like to know is, do my ID tags look like your ID tags? Because if my ID tags don't look like your ID tags, your immune system is going to recognize my kidney as foreign and is going to attack it. So that happens in the phenomenon known as rejection of an organ. Okay? So those ID tags are very, very important. Now you might say, well, why does our body do that? Okay? Uh, the reason our body does it is our body has a very keen immune system that is involved in recognizing what is foreign and what's not foreign. That actually protects you against viruses and a variety of things. Okay? So um, the side effect is that it may be difficult for you to get a transplant, but the most important benefit is that you are alive because your immune system has gotten you to this point. So there's a yin and yang associated with that. What's that? Yes, so they can actually be, they can be uh, close enough, in fact, identical, so that that reduces the likelihood that there's going to be issues with the transplant. Yes, indeed. So one of the things that they'll look for in a transplant um, possibility is just that. Uh, how close are the ID tags to each other? And uh, there's not a gigantic number, uh, so you can have uh, tags that, that, that match somebody else. Yes, sir? Yeah. You gonna put it in the freezer? Well, no. You, it's gonna stay. But like, is there a way like I can like take some medication or something like that that's gonna like make my immune system? Yeah. So his question is, uh, can I take a uh, medication that will keep my body from rejecting the organ? And there are what are called immune suppressive drugs that will reduce the likelihood of the um, rejection occurring. So yes, uh, you can have that, and in fact, that can um, uh, provide si significant help. If you can avoid that as much as possible, then you probably want to do that. Um, I, have, uh, I, I know people, for example, who've had um, a, a heart valve transplant from a pig. You know? And so they have to stay on immune suppressive drugs essentially the rest of their lives because um, if, they, if they don't, their body is going to cause a problem for it. So, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah, so are there are a certain number of categories uh, for that. There are some categories, uh, some different groupings of those, and I'm not an expert in this, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Uh, the wait lists really uh, relate partly to that, but more so to the, um, the amount of urgency of the need. So, for example, for a heart uh, transplant, uh, the most defining factor usually comes down to uh, is at the time that you need it, is there an organ available uh, to give that transplant? Uh, and as I'm sure you all know, there's a shortage of organs for, uh, available for transplant, so that's usually where the problems arise. But you do want to give a transplant uh, with similar types. Uh, that's just the best of all worlds uh, to do. No doubt about it. Okay. Ooh, what did I just do? Yeah, get back here. Uh, okay. Um, there's the membrane layers. You can now see a little bit more there. What that's there. And what's amazing to me is they can actually do this. I mean, there's techniques of microscopy where you can actually see electron micrographs where they have peeled off the layers, and then you can look. 
you feel kind of it's kind of like a voyeur looking inside of this this this, bi, this cell bilayer or something. I don't know. It's, it's kind of weird, but the techniques are pretty phenomenal to do that. And there's one of the techniques right there. So this has been peeled off, and you can see actually what you're seeing um, are uh, this is I believe the if I recall correctly this portion over here is the opposite layer, and then here and there's this is one layer. You're looking at the inside face. This is the outside uh, where that layer has been peeled off. And another thing that you can see in this is all those little bumps that are on there, those are all proteins. So cells can have a heck of a lot of protein in them. If you look at a mitochondrion, for example, about 90% of the weight of the, of the membrane of a mitochondrion is protein. Other uh, cell types may have a uh, protein content that might be as low as 10%. So there's very different types of membranes, and those membranes have very different types of functions. We'll talk about later about mitochondria, and I think you'll see why mitochondria are so rich in uh, proteins. Yes? Do the integral proteins and the embedded proteins move? Uh, all of these will move. In fact, that's what I'm just getting ready to say a brief word about, which is the fluid mosaic model. They all will move. The more integral they are, the, the slower their movement. The larger they are, the slower their movement. The more peripheral they are, the faster their movement. Uh, and the smaller they are, the faster the movement. So yes, all of these will move. And membranes, that's again why the fluidity of membranes is important. So all these things can move and interact with each other. OK. OK, uh, the fluid mosaic model. Oh, I, oh I, I, I'm sorry, I, forgot to, I meant to mention it there. So the fluid mosaic model, which, which is, uh, thank you for asking me the question now that I know I to get back and, and tell you about it. The fluid mosaic model is very simple. It simply says that, mem that, that um, proteins and other molecules in a membrane act as if the membrane is a fluid. That's really all it says. It's very, very simple. And there are some very cool experiments that you can do. People have taken, for example, and taken uh, a laser and treated uh, a cell with a very tiny portion of the membrane with a laser that will color that portion that the laser hits very uh, quickly. So if you do that on a cell, and you've got a very tiny laser, such that it only hits a little portion of the membrane of the cell and gives you, let's say, a red color at that spot, and you give time over the, mat over the, the, the matter of a few minutes, that red spot that starts out at a very tiny place will diffuse all the way through the cell, all the way around the membrane of the cell. And that tells you, of course, that a membrane is not a solid structure, but that, in fact, there's movement and motion all the way through that membrane. And that's what gives rise to the fluid mosaic model. And that's, that's really all it says. Yes? That's correct. And that's, 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 that's what I was sort of trying to say earlier. It's, it's widening that transition temperature. So the transition temperature is going from a very solid state to a very fluid state. It, with no cholesterol, they're like this, up and then straight up and like that. With cholesterol, okay, you go from this state to this state by a slow, gradual process. That's really what's happening with that. Okay. And the last thing is kind of a cool technique, okay? Well, these molecules that I've been describing to you, I said, well, if you take glycerol phospholipids, you will find that they will arrange themselves all by themselves into lipid bilayers. So maybe we could use this tendency of these molecules to form lipid bilayers in water uh, to our advantage. And in fact, that's what is, uh, is up here. Okay? If I take, um, let's imagine I have a uh, compound I would like to introduce into my cells. Let's say it is a poison. And this poison I want to give to my cancer cells so that my cancer cells uh, will die. Okay. Well, if I take that poison and I just, say, inject it into my bloodstream, okay, and sort of hope the cancer cells take it up, all right, it may or may not work. And the reason it may or may not work is, again, because that lipid bilayer is a barrier. It's providing protection not only for your regular cells, but also for those cancer cells. So the uptake of that particular poison is going to depend on the poison. But the uptake of that particular poison might be such that it doesn't make it across the membrane very carefully. There's a company in town called, in, in Corvallis called AVI Biopharma. 
and they have the most amazing drugs. If anybody's interested in these drugs, I'll, I'd be happy to tell you about them, that are phenomenal in their precision for what they will, that what they will kill. You can knock out a cancer cell, you can knock out an HIV infected cell, you can do all kinds of stuff, but the problem is getting these things into the target cells. The membranes provide a barrier. Well, one of the strategies for avoiding, for getting across that barrier is to create artificial membranes. So let's imagine I've got a mixture of glycerophospholipids and sphingolipids, and I take and I stir them into a beaker full of water. Well, they're going to sort of arrange themselves in lipid bilayers, and if I take and I sonicate them, what will happen is they're going to get all jumbled up, and as they come back together, they're going to sort of arrange themselves kind of like they do with a cell. The inside portion, which would correspond to the cytoplasm of the cell, would might look like this. The outside portion is everything else that's out here. Well, if I start with a drug mixed in with this, these compounds, I might get that drug located right square inside of there. Now, this turns out, if that's the case, to be a very cool way of delivering the drug to target cells. Why? Because these guys here have a chemical property identical to the chemical property in the membranes of my cells. They will fuse with it. So when they fuse with the membrane of my cells, they deliver the contents of that to the cells as well. So this technique right here involves the creation of what, I, what we call liposomes. A liposome is a man-made structure. It's made using glycerophospholipids and sphingolipids. And it's used as a way of delivering things into target cells. Very cool technology, a very efficient technology. The problem is, if you're trying to deliver a poison to cancer cells, how do you keep it out of regular cells? There's the problem. It's called a liposome, L-I-P-O-S-O-M-E. What's that? Yes, so a liposome is a man-made structure from glycerophospholipids and sphingolipids that's used as a means of delivering uh, things into cells. In other words, it's a way of getting things across the cell membrane, basically. So it's a man-made structure. I want to emphasize that. But it's very effective at doing what it does. And no, you don't even know it's a unilamellar vesicle, blah, blah, blah. No. All right. Now, we are at the point of talking about strategies now for getting things across membranes. And yeah, we've got about... Uh, not quite 10 minutes yet. Okay. Here is a membrane, an artificial membrane I've got in a laboratory. And here is uh, on this side water, and here on this side is water. And I've got a molecule that, has a, that, that is dissolved in this water. The same molecule is dissolved in the water over here. And we can see that the molecule is at a higher concentration on the left side than it is on the right side. Okay? If there is uh, a, an impermeable layer, that is, it's difficult that the, the, the molecule can't cross the membrane by itself, okay? but water can, what's going to happen? You've done this experiment in biology. What's going to happen? So water is going to move over here and uh, keep, or try to, to equalize the concentrations across the two. The reason it's doing that, what's that? I, I said, might be lysis, yeah, it might, it might burst it. You, you could have that happen as well, okay? Now, the reason that that's happening is that this concentration gradient provides energy. A concentration gradient provides energy. It's providing sufficient energy for the water to move over there to try to equalize that so that the concentration gradient isn't present. We're not going to worry about the energy term here, okay? But suffice it to say that the energy term is uh, written in view of the difficulty of moving against it. The difficulty of moving against it. Okay? If I try to move against the concentration gradient, I have to put energy in to do it. If you put the math in here and you see C2 is greater than C1, it tells us that the delta G is positive. And delta G positive reactions aren't very favorable, so if I want to make it favorable, I've got to push. I've got to provide energy to overcome that. Well, you know that's true. That's why diffusion happens. 